everybody doing? Good, good. Hey, my name's Ty. I'm one of the pastors here. It is great to be with you. Happy Easter. You look great. Someone did a great job dressing you, or you did it yourself. Way to go. Thank them if they bought you a nice tie or whatever that was. Thank them. That's good. That's good. Hey, it really is great to be with you. I'm glad each and every one of you are here. Uh, this morning, I, I'm going to keep it super simple. I'm a pretty simple guy. I, I'm going to kind of tip my hands and tell you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I'm going to tell you about Jesus living a perfect life and Jesus dying a death on the cross, and then tell you about Jesus beating the grave. He was victorious. He resurrected after three days, defeating sin, Satan, and, and death. And from that simple yet very good news, which is called the gospel, uh, there's many things, many ramifications that come from that. But I, I want to point us to one thing today, that from Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, from that one thing, we have the opportunity to have true and real peace. Now, here's the neat thing about peace. No matter where you find yourself at life today, no matter if you love Jesus, you like Jesus, you're indifferent to Jesus, you hate Jesus, whatever that is, you don't know Jesus, no matter where you find yourself at the day, we all have that one same uh, want, that one same desire in life that we truly want some peace. Am I right? I mean, no one wakes up and say, man, I, I want to have a lot of hostility and a lot of anger and a lot of anxious, you know, anxiety today. No one wakes up wanting a lack of peace. No, everyone wants peace. No one says, man, I can't wait to go get gas after work at Costco. Because you know that's not a peaceful place either. Man, I can't wait to turn my radio to nothing but a Nickelback station or something. No, nothing peaceful at all about that. I, I hope I go home tonight and my water heater's out because I'm looking forward to a cold shower or whatever that is. Like, oh, and speaking of tonight, you know your kids tonight are going to tell you, hey, mom and dad, I know it's been uh, spring break, but we totally forgot about this project that's due tomorrow. Oh, hey, you ever been there? Am I the only person that's happened to multiple times? See, we all want peace. We, the reality is we live in a world where there's not a lot of peace. But it's not even the world there's not a lot of peace. Even within our own souls, even within our own lives, even within our own relationships, we, we want peace. Maybe we come in here today with some life questions, and one of the life questions we have that maybe just been circulating inside of us is, where is, where is my peace? We have a lot of different situations and circumstances going on. For maybe for some of you, you're, you're in a marriage right now, and you just, seem to, you just seem to have the same dead-end conversation that leads to nowhere, and it's just not been a good season for you. You're like, where, where, where's my peace? Or Maybe for some of you, you've fallen victim to substance abuse or, so, or some kind of addiction or something like that, and you just want to be, you know, break free from that. And you're like, where's my peace in that? Maybe for some of you, you thought your health was really good, but it's not very good because you just got the test results or something back, and you're like, man, I would just like to have some peace when it comes to my own, my own health or even some financial peace at times. Some, some of us wish we were broke, but we're like less than broke right now. It's like, man, I wish I had a little bit of peace there as well or, what about the peace that we need for our anxiety and depression, just that dark cloud sometimes on some of us that just looms over us and it's just really hard to find any peace in life? What about that peace as parents when you're watching potentially your teenage children or your adult children kind of go down a path that you know is going to cause them death? You know it's just going to cause them so much pain and hurt and yet you have to stand by and watch them. What, what about, the, what about the, the peace we're looking for in marriage when one of our, you know, your spouse, their hearts turn cold to you and you're just... You're just waiting for them to return to you. What, what, what about just when it seems you're looking for peace and there's just nothing stirring inside of you of just tearing you down and people outside of you tearing you down, and we, we just want peace. Where, where is the peace? It feels like sometimes peace is, is elusive. It feels like sometimes, even when you turn the news on, that there's no peace to be had in the world around us, and we want peace. So what do we do? Well, we try to find peace in a lot of other places new relationships, new habits, new trinkets, new toys or whatever. And they, they may give us a little peace every once in a while, but for some reason, they just leave our hearts and our souls and our minds even more restless than they were before. Where is the peace? What, what if I told you this whole Easter thing, this whole Jesus thing, the whole life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that's where we'll find peace. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tip my hand again and tell you, well, some of you are probably thinking a little bit skeptical, like, well, Ty, you're telling me if I trust Jesus, if I have Jesus, I'll have peace and all my life is going to be cupcakes and rainbows. Remember the movie uh, Napoleon Dynamite when Napoleon promised that if you vote for Pedro, all your wildest dreams will come true? Is that what the pastor's saying? Trust Jesus, all your wildest dreams come true? No, no, no. There, there's still pain in life. There's still suffering in life. There's still hostility in life. But you, you're, when you trust Jesus because of his life, because of his death, and because of his resurrection, 
You, you have this new peace that where you can weather the storms, that Jesus is with you during the storms. And that's, that's what I want to talk about today. I just want to talk about the peace that Jesus gives. So if you've got a Bible, we'll be in the book of Hebrews. If you know anything about the Bible, the Bible's a big book. And within that big book, there's 66 other books. And one of those books is called the book of Hebrews, written about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and, and so that was writing to uh, some Christians that were going through some hostility. They had persecution coming from other people, persecution from the government. And that caused a lot of turmoil within their relationships, within their life. And the writer is telling them about how Jesus is there and Jesus can sympathize and Jesus has compassion and Jesus is ultimately going to bring their peace. When you get to the 13th chapter of that, of that book, there's this two verses, like this little prayer talking about peace. And that's what, I, I, that's what I want to focus on this morning. So if you've got a Bible, you can go there. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We'll put it on the screen for you. If you would like to have a Bible, out there at Centerpoint, there's English and Spanish ones out there as well that you just walk by and grab. You don't have to ask for it. It's totally free. Uh, we, we do want to give you one of those. But we'll be in Hebrews chapter 13. All I want to do today is I just want to show you two things that, that God is doing when it comes to peace. Just Two things that God is, is showing, God is proving because of his peace. Two things. Is that, is that cool if we do that today? Okay. Five of you are cool with that. The rest of you are not. So here's the reality. I got a mic. So here we go. All right. Hebrews 13, verse 20. This is this prayer. This, it's a benediction prayer. It's like an ending prayer, closing it out. He says, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. So he's talking about the resurrection right there. Who brought again our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. So he's calling Jesus this great shepherd by the blood, speaking back to Good Friday, speaking back to him dying on the cross of the eternal covenant. So let me kind of break this down a little bit. What's the first thing that God does? Well, the first thing is this. God made peace. God made peace. God made peace because he is the God of peace. There is no chaos within God. There's not. He can be, he can be trusted because there's no chaos in him. Peace is in, the intrinsic nature and character of who God is. God's peace is more than just the absence of conflict, though. It's more than just tranquility. God's peace, him being the God of peace, is more about his completeness, his, his wholeness, his welfare, his well-being, that he is it's peaceful. So if if there's so much, such a lack of peace in this world and such a lack of peace in us, and God is the God of peace, when it, it reasons that God is not the problem when it comes to peace, is it? Well, where does the problem lie when it comes to peace? Anybody want to guess? Us! It, it, it's us. That, that actually the reality is that this world is broken, it's broken by sin, and so are we. We, we, we have sin. We are sinners. Now, some of you may say, well, Ty, I'm not a sinner. I have never once sinned. Well, that's called a lie. <laughs> and so... That's you. And so now, welcome to the bunch. You're in a safe place for sinners here called Grace Point Church. But we, but we, 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 are, we are the problems because we, we have sinned. And so there's no like 15 steps to solutions to your sin or here's how you can make yourself better. There's nothing like that. There's no way to improve upon you being a sinner and me being a sinner. There's no way to do that as well. The Bible actually says that we're, we're even rebellious in our sin. There's another book of the Bible called Romans. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says this. It says, for the wages of sin is, is death. And so there's a, there's a payment. We get paid out. Like, it's payday. Well, the payday is death. Now, we may be thinking, wait a minute, I'm a sinner. How come I'm not dead right now? Because you are all still alive right now, right? Man, you keep, keep doing you, boo-boo, because you're doing great. Keep, keep staying alive because you're doing it really good. But but the, the death he's talking about right there is that we have this, this, the death of a relationship. There's brokenness between us and God. We're in this estranged relationship, not because of him. Oh, no, no, it's because of us. He's the God of peace. We're the ones that are, that are hostile to him. And so that death is separation in our relationship with him, and that blows everything up in our lives. C.S. Lewis, a wonderful author, he, he said this about it. He said, fallen man, sinner, us, is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. We wonder why we lack peace. It's because we are rebels. Now, I did omit half of that verse in Romans 6. You got to read the other half. Look at the other half in Romans 6, 23. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is, the eternal, is, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, but... Much like a Sir Mix-a-Lot song there, the Bible has some big butts in it, and we're very thankful for that. And so there's a transition that we could be receiving the wages of our death, but there's an opportunity, <laughs> there's an opportunity for, for life, and our life comes through, through Jesus. God, God wants to make, make peace with us, and he makes peace, peace with us through, through Jesus. 
See, here, here in a little bit, just a little bit, I'll be short today. I'm short always, but I'll be short today in my life. So uh, we're going to baptize people. You're going to see men, men and women come, and boys and girls come. We, I think we baptized six, seven, eight. I can't remember the first one. And so we're baptizing all day long. But you're going to see them come, and what they're doing is they're declaring something when they get in the water. They're declaring that, that peace has been made on their behalf because they've trusted Jesus Christ. They're saying, because of Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, I now have life with God, I have peace with God, and not only identifying with the gospel there, but identifying with 2,000 years of Christianity. They're saying, I have peace with this new family now called the family of God, the household of faith, the Bible says. I have peace with the church. You're, you're going to see that in just a moment. Keep, keep that in your mind. I, I want you to, to think upon that. Back to the text. Verse 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. So that is who we celebrate here at Grace Point each and every week. This is, if you're new to us, and you think, well, I wonder what we do on every other Sunday. We, we talk about Jesus. Everything here is focused upon Jesus. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. And so we focus upon our great shepherd. Now, this verse right here talks about blood. If you were here with us uh, at Good Friday, we really focused upon Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus poured out his blood. He shed his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And so Jesus was perfect innocent, spotless, has no sin whatsoever, and yet he goes to the cross and dies on our behalf. And what he's doing is he's paying the wages of our sin, which is death. We just saw that. And so Jesus is paying for it by his blood. He goes on our behalf. He is our substitute. He's the fall guy in the story. And by faith, we trust him to do that. And that's where our peace is coming from. He willingly does this. And what, what the idea is that Jesus pays pays our penalty, pay, pays our wages on the cross, and God raising him back to, to life three days later is him accepting the payment, payment accepted in full. And that's how we have the forgiveness of sin. I was recently reading this thing uh, called a book, and it had this story in it. I, I don't know why I paused there. It had this story in it called The Merciful King, and it was using this, this illustration to really illustrate what Jesus did on the cross. Now, I, it's a couple minutes long, but I really want to share it with you because it's just magnificent. It's called The Merciful King. Once upon a time in a kingdom far away, there lived a great king. He was simultaneously the most powerful man in the kingdom and the kindest and gentlest man in the entire realm. The kingdom was known for peace and harmony and goodwill. Neighbors cherished one another. Years would pass without a single crime being committed. One day, however, the chief servant of the king came into the throne room with ill tidings. There is a thief in the realm of your kingdom, sire, said the servant. The king was astonished. Find that thief, and when you do, bring him to me. He will be punished with 10 lashes. Now, lashes are like a whip on your back. Those in the room were astonished. It had been so long since a crime had been committed that they could hardly imagine who could do such a thing. A week went by, and several, uh, the servant again made his way into the throne room. I have bad news for you, sire. The servant, the servant reported quietly, the thief has not been found, and he continues to rob your people. In anger, the king raised his voice and said, find the thief, and when you do, he will receive 25 lashes. The people begin to murmur among themselves. Who could withstand such a punishment? Who could possibly be committing such a crime? But as time went on, the servant once again came back into the throne room with yet another bad report. Your majesty, the thief has not been found. We have searched in vain for him. Your people are still being robbed. The king was enraged. Find that wretched thief. And when you do, his punishment will be 50 lashes. Now, the people were filled with dread. They, they were not even sure the king himself could withstand such a, such a mighty punishment. And if he could not, then certainly no one could. Who could do such a thing? Soon afterward, the servant again approached the king in his throne room, his face with pale and his voice with timid and hollow. He said, your highness, spoke the servant. The thief has been found. Well, bring him in this instant, cried the king. The, cr the crowd had poured into the throne room slowly, parted ways, revealing the thief who now stood trembling in the middle of the room. To the utter, utter shock and dismay of all, it was the king's aged mother. There she stood, trembling and crying. Her small and frail body was shaking with fear and shame. She was perhaps the very last soul anyone would thought could, who could commit such a crime. And there stood the king, deeply wounded. The crowd began to wonder and murmur among themselves, what will the merciful king do? Will he set aside the law and display his love and mercy by forgiving his mother for her crimes? Or will he display his sovereignty and justice by giving her exactly what she deserves? 
Will he choose mercy or will he choose justice? The king raised his hand to quiet the crowd. Bring the whipping post, he yelled. The crowd was dumbfounded. Would the king truly have his mother receive such a punishment? Even the king scarcely survived such a flogging. This frail woman would not even last a few strokes. The old woman was tied to the post. Her garment was rent, exposing her back to the whipmaster. Her ribs could be counted for her frailty. Administer the lashes, he said. Not a sound could be heard as the whip was raised. But just as the whipmaster was about to unleash his first stroke, he cried, halt. The crowd sighed in utter relief, but not for long. The king stood up from his throne, slowly removed the crown from his head, laying it upon his regal seat. As he began to walk down the stairs toward his mother, he laid aside his royal robe and his finely woven tunic. Coming to his mother, he wrapped his his enormous body around her, completely enveloping her under his frame. And then he said, now administer the lashes. This is what Jesus has done for us. We are the ones who deserved the cross. It was for our sins, not Jesus. He had no sin whatsoever. And yet Jesus comes to us and he takes the cross on our behalf. The cross is where God's justice, because God is good, God is perfect, God is at peace. His justice is met with his mercy by sending Jesus on our behalf. He is the one that says right there that the blood of the eternal covenant, but only by the shedding of Jesus' blood, may we find peace. He's made peace. Not when we could save ourselves and not when we could work it off ourselves. Even the book of Romans again says in Romans chapter 5, while we were still weak, it's not that we could be strong enough, it's while we're weak, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. If we are sinners, we are considered ungodly. He said he didn't die for the good people, didn't die for the moral people, didn't die for the religious people. It says he died for the ungodly, for one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, right now, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what Easter is pointing to, that Jesus would take his cross for our sins so we may have peace. But what, what now? What, what does this mean to our life now? That's got to be the question we start to ask. Like, okay, got it, got it. Jesus died in my place. But what, what does that mean for our life now? Well, that means the first thing I said is that God made peace. That's the first point. God made peace. But what else does it mean? Well, I want to show you the second thing. Look at verse 21 in Hebrews. So God made this peace and he says, equip you, so equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So God not only made peace, but God also gives peace. It's one thing that he made peace, but now he, he's freely giving it out. You've already seen a couple of verses where he's giving it out like a, like a free gift. He gives peace. So f- for, for those who trust Jesus, for those who are followers of Jesus, for those who are Christians, you now have peace with God. For you, for you that do not, you can have peace because he's, he's giving peace. Now, we read in this verse, it says something about God's will, that you may do God's will. As a pastor, I get asked a lot of questions, and I absolutely love it. But one of the questions I get asked a whole lot is, what is God's will for my life? I want to know what God's will is for my life. If I knew God's will, I would follow God's will. It's the most thing that people want to know all the time. Right here, it says that when you have the peace of God, because God made peace, and when God gives you his peace, you are going to be equipped to know his will. He's going to make it possible, and he's going to empower you not only to know his will, but the word says equipped right there, to actually do his will, to live out his will. I mean, think about how much chaos, think about how much restlessness we have by not knowing what in the world we're here for, by not knowing who in the world we are. Most of us, we have no idea really who we are. We only know who people tell us to be or who people celebrate us to be. We don't even know who we are, let alone what in the world we're here to do or, or how we're supposed to live this life. Right here in this text, it's saying when you know the peace of God, when you have trusted Jesus, he's going to equip you, equip you. The, the word equip here is an interesting word. The word equip in the original, it's originally written in Greek, and so we translate it to English. The, equip means to mend, to, to make right, to, to fix what has been broken, to make something useful again. Think about it like this. Think about how much brokenness we as people have experienced apart from God. 
seeking peace in so many other things outside of God that have left us broken, wounded, weary, tired, weak, damaged. And right here, the text is like a promise, promising that God is going to equip, that God is going to mend, that God is going to make right, that God is going to, to repair and make useful again. Bring us meaning, bring us value, bring us identity. That's what the text is saying right here. Listen to what it says in Ephesians, another book of the Bible, Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Well, we didn't do anything to deserve this. He says, this is not of your own doing. It is the what? The gift of God, that God gives us grace. He gives us peace, not a result of works. It's not a result of your religion, not a result of you cleaning yourself up, not a result of you trying to be better, not, not a result of that, so that no one may boast. And he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand. Who prepared it for us? You can answer that out loud. It's right on the screen. God. This, this, that's his will. That he's prepared that. So when we trust Jesus, he's going to give that to us so we can just walk that out. That's the good news of the peace of God, that we, not only our souls are saved, that death is no longer there, that we, we're not separated and estranged from God anymore, but he's going to give us, he's going to equip us in life to, to, follow, to, to follow Jesus. He, let me summarize it like this. Here's what the Bible is saying emphatically over and over. If there's no Jesus in your life, there will be no peace in your life. No Jesus, no peace. But if you know Jesus, like K-N-O-W, if you know Jesus, you will know peace. That's the truest of true statements. I lived my first 23 years without Jesus. I had no peace whatsoever. Now I know Jesus. I know what peace is. I, I, I understand it. Now, some of you got to be a little skeptical because I'm a pretty skeptical person myself. You got to be a little skeptical and say, whoa, 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 Ty, you telling me, are you telling me? This sounds too good to be true. If you trust Jesus, if you trust Jesus, you'll know peace and, and everything's going to be okay. Everything will be cupcakes and rainbows and I'll have no problems the rest of my life. If you're telling me my life is going to be, be amazing after I trust Jesus, that my debt is all going to disappear, my boss will not be there on Monday morning at work, the issue that my spouse and I keep fighting about will just magically disappear, uh, my kids will obey you know, perfectly all the time, which we all wish, my patients will be that of a saint, they will ban Nickelback from the radios, um, any addictions will be gone, and um, all that good stuff. Are you, are you saying that? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. It's not true. But what, what Jesus is going to do, you're going to get a different peace than you've, than you've ever known in your life if you've not known Jesus. You tried to have peace in relationships, and relationships were good. You tried, tried to have peace in stuff, and stuff's fine. But it doesn't last. What Jesus says, he's giving you something different. Let's listen to the words of Jesus himself in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave you. My peace, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. It's not this temporary fleeting peace. It's not this peace that seems to evaporate all the time. No, 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 no. This is the lasting peace of Jesus. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus has given this peace. In the Bible, it's called shalom. Shalom in the Bible is a holistic peace. Holistic peace. It's this peace that passes understanding. It's this peace in the middle of life's storm that just doesn't make sense, and yet you can still stand. And it's only because someone is standing with you. It's Jesus. If you have no Jesus, you'll have no peace. But if you know Jesus, oh, you will have peace. Listen to the words of C.S. Lewis. He said it like this. He said, life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in difficulties. This is huge. Listen to me, because I, I want to make sure you're understanding Christianity. Christianity is not trust Jesus and everything's amazing. Oh, no, no. No, most pastors will tell you that that's not true. There's going to be difficulties, but listen to me, listen to me. Peace, the peace of Jesus is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of Jesus in your trouble, that you're not alone that someone is suffering, someone is sojourning along with you in, the, in, in life's troubles and life's pains and life's sorrows. Jesus is there with us. When all hell breaks loose to know that God is with you, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. See, here's the thing about Jesus. If we're not careful, we see Jesus as just a relig religious figure, Jesus just as a Sunday guy. We see Jesus as transactional. He's just some kind of transaction to make. Jesus is not transactional. Jesus is relational. The Bible calls him, Jesus calls him God with us, that he comes to us. 
in a relationship. Many of you may know things about Jesus, but you may not know Jesus in relationship. He is to be known. How is this peace possible? God made peace. God gives peace. How do we receive this peace? Many of you here may be wondering, I want this peace. How do I receive this peace? Look back at Hebrews 13, 21. It says this in the second sentence, it's working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. It says, through Jesus Christ. The only way to have this peace, the Bible tells us very clearly, is through Jesus Christ. Jesus says this of himself in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to me. No one has peace with God except through him, is what he's saying right there. And so there is a way, there is an opportunity to have peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you can have peace with the world around you as well. You have the peace of God that passes all understanding, the peace of God that just surpasses all storms. I must ask, though, do you, do you know Jesus? Like, no, like, I mean, know Jesus, like relationally. Do you, have you submitted your life to Jesus? Many of you probably have. You say, hey, man, I follow Jesus I followed Jesus a long time ago. I became a Christian a long time. I know things about Jesus. Like, I, I used to be down with Jesus, and, but, but something happened. Something happened in life to where, like, you know, I, I just, I'm just not into that anymore. You got busy. You got distracted. Life happened. You got maybe spouse some kids and some, you know, responsibilities and opportunities, and life happened. M- maybe the reason why you probably wa- walked away from God is m- maybe, like, you thought God should do one thing in your life, and God did something else. You zigged, and God zagged. And you're like, whoa, whoa, God, I thought you, and like you're, maybe you're, you're upset with God. Maybe for some of you, it's not you walking away from God. You think, you think that God has walked away from you. Maybe it's church hurt. Like, you know, church has hurt people. It's true. Hey, let me tell you about Grace Point Church. We are an imperfect church. I got a, it's like in the first gathering, someone said, amen. I was like, whoa, whoa, slow your rope. <laughs> well, you ain't got to say it like that harsh. I'm just kidding. But it's, but it's true. It's true. People hurt people. It's the reality. Every church has sinners in it. We only have one Savior. And so can, can I, if, if that's you, that you've, you've known Jesus but walked away, can I, can I just can I give you something? Can I, can I tell you something? It's not going to be condemnation. I'm not going to sit here and wag my finger and say, where have you been? Does your grandma know you're missing church or anything like that? You know, you know here's what I'm going to say to you. Come home. Come home. You're, you're, this is a safe place. It's an imperfect place. It's a safe place to come, come home. It's a place where you can figure some stuff out. It's a place where you can work, you, you can work through some of that, those wounds and your weariness, your brokenness. It's a safe, come home. You're welcome here. Maybe some of you, maybe some of you have never trusted Jesus. Like you're just here because there's a, someone promised you, you know, lunch afterwards. I'm glad you're here. You're here just to appease somebody. You're here because that's like, just what you're supposed to Like, I'm supposed to go to you. But you don't know Jesus. Here, here, here's what I'm going to ask you. Do, do you want peace? God, God is offering peace to you through Jesus Christ. If you want peace, you can trust Jesus today. You can become a Christian today. You can follow Jesus. You can surrender your life to Jesus, and you can really experience peace. You really can. We've been seeing it all the time. I've seen it, like, I've seen it in my own life to trust Jesus. He really does bring peace. Do you want Jesus today? You can have him. He gives himself to you. Here in a moment, I'm going to pray. And here's what I thought about what might be helpful for you. You'd be like, I don't don't know how to trust Jesus. You can pray and trust Jesus. You may have your own words of like, Jesus, I want to trust you. I love you or whatever that is. But I I, I hear in a minute when I pray, I'm going to put a, a, a prayer I wrote up on the screen. That prayer will not save you. But if your heart cries out to Jesus, and that might be some words, give you a vocabulary to do that, Jesus will save you. And so I'm going to ask today, why would you not follow Jesus? Why would you not trust Jesus for peace? That opportunity is there for you as well. And then if you trust Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to do something very unexpected. After I pray and say amen, everyone in just a moment is going to stand up and we're going to sing a song. And during that song, I'm going to ask you to walk out those doors. You're going to see people move around. We've got people, the band going out, people going out. You're just going to walk out that door and there's going to be men and women out there that are going to talk to you. And you're going to say, hey, I, I prayed to trust, trust Jesus. And they're like, great, tell me about that. You're going to talk about it for a minute. And then they're going to say, great, let's, let's get you baptized. And some of you right now, you hear that like, what? It's like, uh, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I, I'm not ready for that. I got my duds on. Like, no, we got you covered. We got shorts and shirts out there. You're good to go. Hey, we've had people just get in there, like suit and everything. Just make sure you take your phone out of your pocket. But we, we've had that happen. 
Let's be baptized. Well, Ty, why do you want me to be baptized? Does that save me? Baptism does not save you. It's showing, it's proclaiming Jesus saved me. And I identify with his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And I identify with 2,000 years of family, brothers and sisters in Jesus. I identify as the church. And you're to come in here with the other people being baptized saying, yeah, that's me too. That's me too. Now, I know every excuse will pop in your mind. I don't know enough. I don't know if I'm ready or whatever it is. Listen to me. If God is calling you to trust Jesus today, just obey him and see what happens. You ever thought about, like, for some of us, we just kind of push God off, push God off. Stop pushing God off. Like, God, you, you said go, I'll, I'll go. For some of you, maybe you, you have a religious background. You would say, hey, well, Ty, I, I, I kind of grew up in a Catholic tradition, and when I was a baby, I was baptized, but I really didn't know or, or, or don't know about this Jesus thing, and now I'm hearing about this Jesus thing. I really want to trust Jesus. What do I do? And here's what I would tell you, my Catholic friend. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. But, but, but Ty, there's a tension in my heart of like, I don't want to betray my family, and I don't want to betray my tradition. What should I do? And here's what I would tell you. Your family and your tradition are a wonderful thing, a glorious thing, a beautiful thing, and you honor them through that. And if the Lord Jesus calls you to trust him, you trust him and you be baptized as well. You can hold both of those tensions in your heart. You can do that. I'm telling you, you can do that. You tell your family, I honor that, and I, and I treasure that, and I appreciate that upbringing. But Jesus has called me to this, and I, I want to obey Jesus. You can hold that tension in your heart. And I would say, go today. Go today. W w listen, baptism is saying, I follow Jesus. I follow. He is mine. So if you want the peace of God today, trust Jesus. I'll have that prayer on the screen for you. Trust Jesus. And in a moment when we sing, you're going to walk right out those back doors, okay? Look, if you brought someone with you and you, like, you just don't know where they're at, here's your cue. Here in a minute, say, hey, if you want to trust Jesus, I'll go with you, okay? If you brought someone, say, hey, I'll go with you. If you want to trust Jesus, I'll walk out there with you. And we'll, like, that way you're not alone. That's being a good friend. Be a good friend today, okay? I'm going to pray for us. And then here in a minute, we're going to celebrate some baptisms. So let me pray. We should have the, the 